In this video, we want to work out how to actually implement a stack using an array as the method of storage. So once again, the stack is an abstract data type. It doesn't tell us how it stores the information. It only says that it needs to have a push and a pop, and the pop needs to be LIFO. So the last thing in is the first thing that comes out. So we have our push, we have our pop, and we're going to add a peak and it is empty. These were the things we decided that we wanted to have inside of our stack. How are we going to implement this using an array? Well, we can picture an array as a basically a set of boxes, and a stack has the top of the stack where we're going to put new things. So for example, if I were to push the value of, say, 5 into a stack of integers, well, now that would be the top element. And we might want to move this to keep track of the next thing that we were storing. Maybe we push a 3 on. And then the top value has to move further down. This top could be stored as just an integer index into the array. If I push maybe an 8, I get that. And the top has to move further down, always keeping track of where the next element would go. Actually, you could keep track of where the current top element is. It's up to you. You just have to be consistent in how you implement all the methods. My implementation will work the way I've drawn this here, where we start with the top being zero, and then it always points to the next element where something would be added if we push something new. There's also the consideration of what do we do when this gets to the end of the array. And that's, that's an important consideration for, uh, that we'll need to talk about some. So, how do we actually implement this in code? We're going to make a new class, and we're going to call it ArrayStack, because it's going to implement our stack interface. Or our stack, you know, we have it as a stack trait. It's going to implement that, uh, but it's going to use an array to back it. I give it the type parameter A, and I'm going to go ahead and just copy these methods over. Because they're documented in the original trait, I'm not going to have comments on this version. What information do I need to store? Well, we have the array and we have an integer value that stores where the next thing will go. So we need to add those into here. A private var, how about we call it data? And that's going to be an array that can hold things of type A. Now, I'm about to do something that we very rarely do in Scala, and that is to create an array using new. Um, but there's, there's a reason for that that we kind of need to explore as well. First, let me go ahead and declare the top to be an integer that starts off at zero. So the issue here is that this array uh, I don't know, normally when I if I want to create an array with 10 things in it, I'd use array.fill. But using array.fill requires me to give it a value to put into there. And I don't know what the type A is, so I don't know what value I could initialize this with. In fact, it turns out the way this code is written right now, Scala has a problem, and we have this error because Scala can't figure out what type to use for A. If A were an int, it should be 0. If it were a double, it should be 0, 0.0. If it were a boolean, it should be false. If it were a uh, string or any other uh, reference type, it should be null. Okay. In order for Scala to know what type, we have to put basically a restriction. Actually, this isn't necessarily a restriction. This is We're telling Scala to include additional information. So I put this colon class tag, and what that actually does is it pro provides an extra argument, and that class tag has information about A, so that Scala knows how to make an array of A, and knows what values to put inside of that array. Okay, 
So given just this, when I implement code, I often like to start with the easiest methods, um, partially because it gives you a sense of success when you've written something uh, and you've completed it. Also because it turns out writing the easy methods can help you to understand how you're going to write the harder methods. So is empty. Well, it turns out this is empty if the top is zero. If the top's not zero, then we uh, then we have something in there. Yes, in our drawing here, we didn't actually talk about what happens when I do a pop. When I do a pop, this needs to move back to here, and we're going to give back that value. Okay, and we'd keep going, and it could be decremented. Peak. Peak is also easy. So after doing is empty, I'm going to do peak. This is going to return data at top minus one. Remember that our top here points one past. So in this configuration, it is pointing one beyond where the highest element is because it's pointing at the top as in where the next thing will go. So when I give back the data for the peak, I'm just giving back the element at top minus one. What about pop? Well, pop needs to give back that element, but it also needs to decrement top. So we're going to say top minus equals one, and then we're going to give back data sub top. Now, one thing this is not doing right now, and this is an, an oversight that kind of can be corrected, we're not going to really worry about it, is it does not clear it out. It does exactly what I did in this picture, where when we pop, we simply move this back to here. We give back the eight, but there's still a reference to the eight here. And there are situations where that can cause issues. It can be a resource leak for, for memory. Um, it's not one of the things that we're going to deal with. Once again, we have this problem that unless we go through some additional effort, we don't know what value we could store in, the, in, this, val in this location to clear it out because it could be an int, it could be a Boolean, it could be a string. We don't know what to store there. The last operation, we're not going to write a complete definition of it in this video, is push. Just by putting some curly braces there, I've made it so that this compiles, uh, but obviously that's not quite correct. So when we push onto this, we need to add the new element to the top and then move top. So data sub top equals a the new element we're adding, and top plus equals one. Now what is this lacking? Well, it's currently lacking the possibility, or, or a check, for the possibility that we have gone past the end of our array. Okay, so we start off with 10 elements. What happens if we just add an 11th thing here? Well, if we attempted to do that, then this would be an index out of bounds exception. So we need to have a check if the top is greater than or equal to data dot length. We need to do something about it. We're going to come back and actually do that in the next video because it's worth discussing how we should do this, especially in view of the fact that we have this requirement that our cost for these operations be order one. So we're going to talk about the order of these operations and we're going to talk about how we can put code in here that will wind up preserving the order that we want to have.